Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test the numerous targets located by recent groundwork will commence later this year. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Kay. He's a home ownership consultant, and he also has a great website, thewealthyhomeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Hey, thanks for having me back, Jim. When will the BC Real Estate Association not be able to hide from the general public what's really going on on the BC real estate market? Or are they going to keep misreporting to the mainstream media to try and fuel the false seller's market? Um, the British Columbia Real Estate Association, Canadian Real Estate Association, Ontario Real Estate Association, Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, Toronto Real Estate Board, Calgary Real Estate Board, and on and on and on and on and on. Those organizations, um, trade associations, uh, formed under a Articles of Incorporation, where the membership is the only thing that uh, matters. There is no consumer protection in any of the corporate documents of any organized real estate trade association in Canada. Those organizations have all been built and evolved over the last 40 years to support the sellers of real estate. Support one side, the selling side. That means sellers getting the most amount of money, sellers getting the most traffic through their properties, sellers' properties be, being presented in the best possible light, um, rules and regulations all, decide, all designed to support sellers. And those, all of those organizations also are designed to have a, a vision or a version of house prices in any locale that is beneficial to the seller. That is not going to change. I don't believe, uh, Jim, that it, they even legally could uh, could do it because they would have to change their articles of incorporation. They would have to change all of their MLS cooperative listing service agreements. They would have to change all the agreements that the sellers sign with the brokerages in order to let commissions to be paid. All of that documentation would have to change. You were talking about a revolution in real estate that the current structure uh, of organized real estate is incapable of dealing with. The question you gave me was, is that when will that change? When it's going to change is, is when the housing correction is rolling out at such a magnitude that the net wealth of the Canadian nation crumbles. It is going to take a massive change to net wealth through falling house prices before anyone will start to investigate what's really been going on for the last uh, 13 years. What's gone over the last 13 years is progressively, month after month after month, Real estate metrics have slowly and to the point that they're at now, crazily, misrepresented the market to the buyers of real estate. It is it misrepresents it in order to to get the sellers a higher selling price. That is simply the truth. I'll give you an example. An example would be in Calgary today, where the Calgary Real Estate Board. Uh, just released today saying that everything was, was rosy in Calgary. It was basically a balanced market and that housing prices really weren't go going up or down. They were basically staying the same. What they didn't go on to say is they didn't tell all the home buyers in Calgary that 78% of the homes for sale in Calgary in September didn't sell. Only 23% of the homes offered for sale sold. That means why would any home buyer in their right mind in Calgary, 
pay the asking price for a property when over three quarters of the homes listed for sale don't sell. Now, you're going to say, Ross, well, how's that possible? How are they saying it's a balanced market when you're telling me 78% of the houses listed for sale didn't sell? Well, that's because they don't release that metric to the, to the public. That metric is hidden. It's hidden to protect the members of the Calgary Real Estate Board in the same way the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, Fraser Valley, Victoria Island, uh, Kelowna, they all report the exact same number in the exact same way because they want to protect their members. What consumer would pay 3, 4, 5% commission to, to an industry where they fail 80% of the time? They wouldn't. Let's look at it this way, Jim. You have an industry where one out of every five houses listed for sale sells. That means one home seller paid for real estate services. The other four didn't pay a nickel because their home didn't sell. Those four home sellers received receive the exact same services, advertising, property showing, sign in the front yard, advertisements, uh, feature sheets, computerization, uh, secretarial staff, um, office staff, photographs. Those four people who didn't pay anything received the exact same services that the one who, the one person who actually sold did receive. But the one who actually did uh, sell is the only one who paid. You have an industry that is built on failure where the one person, the one consumer who is lucky enough to have their house sell also has to pay for the real estate services of four other people. That's why you have the real estate statistics released the way that they are and why the question the viewer has uh, given us to here today will not be answered outside uh, by organized real estate. The answers have to come from a firm like myself where we do not get paid uh, any money from the sale of real estate. We are paid simply to give consulting true advice. We are simply uh, paid to interpret the data the way that the data should be interpreted and give an unbiased opinion of the market to both buyers and sellers of real estate. If they really did give us a true picture, would that cause a major correction bigger than the one that's happening, like what happened in the U.S. in 2008? Uh, no. Now, again, I, don't, I do not believe the Canadian uh, market will correct in the same way that the United States States market did. There, there are there are many reasons for that. The main one being, um, in Canada, the bent taxation benefit for owning real estate happens uh, when you sell your your home where you don't pay any capital gain. In the United States, the taxation benefit happens every single month as you get to deduct your mortgage interest paid in a given month off of your income. So that is two radically different markets. Um, in the Canadian market. We have a universal health care system, which means that uh, you're not going to lose your house because of your health care payment. In the United States, um, that's not the case. Uh, if you want to have health care insurance on top of owning a house, it, for, mo for many people, it's practically impossible. And uh, that's the reason. W that's one of the reasons why uh, a Canadian housing correction will not be the same as the American housing correction. The Canadian housing correction, where the real risk is, is, needs to be measured, which, again, we leave to economists um, to comment on, uh, economists who understand how a national economy works. Uh, those economists should be asking these questions. Based on our calculations, the way that we calculate home ownership math and the home trading industry, we believe about 28% of the Canadian economy is being driven now by the housing market as it existed as of June of this year. 28% of the economy. That's our calculation. You're not going to read a number that high anywhere else. We just look at it as the whole package. In other words, we know that money is able to be borrowed from residential real estate, which allows the purchase of automobiles. 
without those rising house prices, we know those automobile sales historically do not appear. Um, we look at the overall impact of the housing market, how it's functioning at any given moment in time. What happens if our calculations are right and the housing market simply slows down? It slows down so the impact on the Canadian economy from real estate is 50% of what it is today. You have a crashing GDP. You have a falling Canadian dollar. At the same time as interest rates are, are, are trying to be bumped upwards. At the same time that the American uh, taxation policy is changing to drive that economy forward. What is the net result of that? The net result is a falling Canadian dollar. A falling Canadian dollar causes inflation. Banks raise interest rates to offset inflation. This is what we have called the current uh, interest rate um, um, problem. The, the current problem with interest rates the way that we are, that they are now and why we call it the interest rate trap. There, it is possible, based on what, what we're looking at, a, a major recession could result from uh, a Canadian house price correction of about 15%, Jim. It doesn't need to be that big. Uh, and at 15%, it could have a cascading effect that draws the, the net wealth of the nation down even less than that. So... That's really where the focus needs to be, and that's really where researchers and economists should be uh, discussing things right now. They don't know how housing markets function, so quit trying to forecast housing markets. You've been wrong for 40 years, economists. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything that's going on with the housing market other than guessing. You didn't receive any training in school. There are no courses on it. You did learn lots of things about the Canadian economy. Consider what would happen if what we're saying was true. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're chatting with Ross K. Ross, with the claimed rise in condo prices in BC, what should young first time homeowners expect when it comes to property taxes? Oh, good question, Jim. Okay. So now we're getting to what we had discussed in previous shows. So I encourage your listeners to go back and look at previous shows that Jim and I had, um, which are in the archives addressing property tax. Because now you're going to see the reality hit home of what we discussed in those earlier shows. Foreign owners of British Columbia real estate are going to have their property taxes lowered come 2018. At the same time, young first-time homeowners in British Columbia who have owned their home for two years are going to see their property taxes increase. That's right, folks. Canadian first-time home buyers are going to pay the difference that foreign owners of luxury class homes are going to come up because of falling house prices. 
we have warned on this show, if I'm not mistaken, Jim, going back as far as three years, that the current property tax assessment model is flawed. It takes a correction, a correcting market, for those flaws to become apparent. They become apparent when something as ludicrous as foreign owners of ultra-luxury class homes in Vancouver have their property taxes paid for by first-time buyers of the most affordable homes in Vancouver. That is exactly what's going to happen when the 2018 property tax rates come out. The way the housing market is was structured as we were as you were entering the spring of 2016 was setting you up for what's about to hit home on January the 1st when property taxes come into play for 2018. The government should not have brought in the foreign buyer tax in the spring market. They should have applied the foreign buyer's tax in the fall market. They should have either done it in the fall of 2016, because they forgot to do it earlier, but really they should have brought it forward in the fall of 2013, is when that tax should have been applied. The very worst time for condominium buyers, or condominium owners, for that foreign buyer tax to be applied was the spring of 2016 because your market was functioning in such a manner in the spring of 2016 that the price pressure on ultra-luxury class homes was at its zenith. And that the price pressure on condominiums was going to appear the following year. What happened? Exactly that happened. Condominium or luxury debt, luxury class homes saw their prices falling, and they have continued to fall for the last uh, 18 months, or excuse me, uh, last 16 months. While condominium buyers have watched property prices for condominiums rise. These are natural consequences of how a housing market functions. It's got nothing to do with supply, well, it's got everything to do with, to do with supply and demand, because how a housing market market functions, it is an imbalanced market by nature. The ba there is never an equal balance between buyers of a category for a certain category of homes against the number of homes in that category that actually come for sale. The market actually is an evolving market where, where this imbalance causes false house price growth to appear. Normally, that's washed out over an 18-month period, and it starts all over again. But in this case, it didn't happen. In this case, on top of that market functioning, a new variable was entered into the market, the foreign buyer tax. The foreign buyer tax was applied at the wrong time of the year. In other words, it was applied at a time of the year that would cause condominium millennial first-time home buyers to pay the price a year later, a year, a full year later, which is exactly what happened. Now, on top of being forced to pay higher than they should have prices, their property taxes for 2018 are going to go up, while foreign owners' owners' property taxes drop. You can listen to all the nonsense that you want, folks, from the property tax assessment offices, from the government. When that tax bill arrives on your front uh, mailbox, you are going to see what I'm saying is right. If you own a condominium under $600,000 in the city of Vancouver, your property taxes are going up. If you own an ultra-luxury class home of uh, over $1.5 million in Vancouver, your property taxes are going down. Canadians are going to make up for the for foreign owners paying less property tax. That's what the, that question you asked me, Jim, really means to the pocketbooks 
of British Columbia. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Ross K. Ross, interest rates have risen two times this year. Do you see that impacting the market anywhere? Uh, impacting the market anywhere. Uh, yes, I do see it impacting the market. Uh, Jim, uh, where it's impacted the market was first-time buyers. It it didn't impact the market because of that half a percent interest rate. It it's ha- it impacted the market because of that interest rate increase happening at the same time the mortgage qualification rate became uh, impacting the market. What I mean to say by that is, is that we track, because we track each category of sales, we see that there has been a decrease in purchase price paid by first-time buyers in Canada. Now, everybody who questions our authority on this is going to get a wake-up call, because when CMHC releases, it's possible we're going to see uh, some, of the, some of this show up in their third quarter CMHC uh, mortgage uh, portfolio review, but it's certainly going to be quite apparent when the fourth quarter review comes into play, because what we're going to see is this. We're going to see that the size of the mortgages has decreased yet again. So even though we are at historically low interest rates, the amount of mortgage being taken out by first-time buyers is going to decrease. Not only is the mortgage rate going to decrease, but the GDS and TDS ratios of those first-time buyers is going to be the best in Canadian history. That's an impact of the mortgage qualifying rate. What your listeners need to do is understand this. Last fall, CMHC raised mortgage insurance. The cost that you pay to purchase a home as a first-time buyer with less than 20% down increase. They're charging you a higher insurance policy rate. They did that at the same time they told you, oh, you can't buy as much house. So our risk is really lower, substantially lower. Roth K. Realty Consultant says, so low, it's going to be a new historical record of low risk, yet we're going to charge you more insurance. What your listeners need to wonder, especially your millennials, your first, those people, or those people under 40 years old, um, and I know they're not all millennials, but I'm going to say everybody under 40. CMHC gave the federal liberals a $4 billion lump sum payment from surplus CMHC funds that no other government in Canadian history got. That happened right after the federal government said to CMHC, we're going to give you guys $250 million to improve CMHC. A quarter later, CMHC said, oh, we have a quarter of a billion dollars to give you once again, government, because we charged too much in CMHC fees. First time millennial home buyers have been so messed over by this government, they have no idea. Your net wealth is being so destroyed by this government, you have no idea. Not only did they take away that extra 5000 a year in TFSA room that the pre- previous government has said they were going to bring in, 
they have also raised your CMHC rate in order for you to buy when you buy your house. Those CMHC rates, of course, are paid through a mortgage, which, of course, are normally amortized over 25 years. They have also told you you cannot accumulate net wealth to the same degree everybody for the past 40, year, 40 years was allowed to do so. And they're also telling you that we are going to raise interest rates because things are too good. And for the first time since your parents bought a house, we are going to start raising interest rates over your lifetime of ownership. That's the reality that today's voter needs to understand. And whether you're talking about housing affordability in British Columbia and the policies of the NDP and the Green, or you're talking about uh, Calgary, housing affordability, mortgage affordability, foreclosure in Alberta, and you're talking about putting maybe putting in a conservative government back in, or you're talking about our federal government where we have liberals in power, you need to start using your vote to get these government officials to sit down and make some rational, fact-based decisions instead of guessing and making decisions that are designed to make their political parties look better. You have a $4.25 billion dividend paid from CMHC to the Liberal government for the first time in Canadian history. That has not appeared in any newspaper in Canada. Why? What's going on? The $250 million the federal government donated to CMHC over the next year, few years for them to bump up their wages, hire more staff, was that a payoff? I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'll tell you, something is fishy. Millennials are the ones who are going to be paying the price. UBS released a huge report stating Toronto had surpassed Vancouver in its housing <laughs> bubble size. In fact, it says Toronto is number one in the world when it comes to a housing bubble. Vancouver, number four. What do you think of those claims? And by the way, could you tell us what UBS is? Yeah, so uh, these uh, these uh, rating industries, these economists, these, these uh, um, uh, consulting companies, um, who, who try to get some PR by their uh, their commentary about uh, the Canadian housing market or housing markets around the world. They simply explain their ignorance when they attempt to do what they're attempting to do. Let me explain this to your listeners. They claim now that Toronto is less affordable than Vancouver. Really? Toronto is less affordable than Vancouver. You can buy a single detached home in Toronto for $500,000. Can you do that in Vancouver, Jim? Uh, excuse me, I'm going to go laugh somewhere and I'll stop in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Wages in Toronto are higher. There's more money being made in Toronto than there is in Vancouver. This the, this this study by UBS is 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 so asinine in, in in our opinion. They when you try attempt to compare the housing market in Canada for affordability and the housing market in the United States. So although they go around the world, we're just going to use these two simple comparisons, and we're even going to go better. We're going to compare New York to Toronto. So these places are what within 200 miles apart. One's in the United States, one's in Canada. But the Canadian housing bubble is worse than new in New York. Okay, guess what, folks? To own a million-dollar property in New York City, you pay $5,000 a year more in property tax than you do in Toronto. Yet, Toronto is less affordable. If you're a family and you own that $1 million house in New York, you also have to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of $7,000 of your income for your family's health insurance program. Of course, those same families in Toronto don't have to pay that out of their pocket. 
Are you really going to try to pretend it's cheaper to own a $1 million house while living in New York City than it is in Toronto? Give your head a shake, people. These economists, analysts, they're so out to lunch, they don't even have an idea what I'm talking about. When you go through their methodology, and this is a massive report, Jim. I think it's like 75 pages or something. Um, when you look how they even measure house prices, they measure house prices using the Federal Reserve in Dallas, Texas, to come up with the Canadian house prices. Then when you read into the, when you go into the more pages, pages that are not even part of this report, to find out how they measure Canadian house prices, you find out that it's the Royal, uh, the Brookfield, uh, um, uh, real, uh, house prices index. Then you find out that they used to use the Royal LePage house price index till they found out it was flawed. So in other words, all the old reports that they used to have are, are, are flawed, even though they don't realize Brookfield owns Royal LePage, and it's the exact same data. On top of that, that now they say they have thrown that out, and they're going to use the MLS H uh, house price index, which we have debunked on this show over and over again as a joke. Um, and they're using that now to uh, judge affordability. So you have such a... Just in looking at Toronto or Vancouver alone, they've used a myriad of different house price indexes over to, over time, it, but they're inputting it the same way. Um, the, the, the bubble metric that they, that they measure, they say that they look at five components that make up the, their bubble metric. So, they, they of course, they don't talk about property taxes, like I told you. Of course, they don't talk about health insurance premiums, like I told you. Of course, they don't talk about... Um, uh, several of the other factors that, you know, I, I don't want to share on, on, on air here because it's part of our proprietary discussion here. Um, they don't use any of those. They want to use the old income to GDP. Okay, so they don't understand how Canadian mortgage debt is totally different than American mortgage debt, making the, the mortgage debt to GDP calculation incomparable. They want to, then they also use as one of their sub portions of this index, rent, rent to house price, uh, rent to house prices. Of course, they don't understand that in Toronto, where they've named the number one bubble city in Canada, that you can't Number one rent. bubble city in the world. <laughs> you, you, you can't compare rent in Toronto even from one from one resident from one rental unit to another, because in Ontario we have rent controls on some properties. We don't have rent controls on other properties. We have some properties which are newly built where they get a premium rent, and we have other properties that are recently built where they don't get that same premium. So when they're using these numbers, they're actually picking the most expensive rental units to measure, which means. 95% of the rental units don't enter the discussion. And when I go to New York City, it's just the opposite. The way that they calculate the rents in New York City are not the same as the way they calculate them in Toronto, making that metric useless. So this appeared in headlines all over the place. It fueled the uh, housing uh, bears argument about uh, the housing market, uh, you know, well, being overpriced and gonna 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 crash um, fuels problems with the government. The government says, "Oh, this big agency is is saying that our house we got the worst housing bubble in Canada." CMHC has report has um, reported on these people's comments comments before, so we know that affects their policy. It is such a bunch of hogwash. Look, people don't buy houses that they can't afford. It is impossible in Canada to do so. Yes, there may be the odd outlier, but that doesn't mean they're unaffordable. The unaffordable problem that we have in Canada is, is that our local municipal government refused to allow the housing stock to increase in size and categories of homes 
to meet the needs of the population. There is no other reason or cause for the unaffordability that we have in our nation. I know that in Ontario, there is such an abundance of land available to build homes in the greater Toronto area that housing prices could correct 30% over time just by allowing that housing stock to change. When I look at British Columbia, people who believe as a first-time home buyer that you have a right because you were born in Vancouver to own a single detached home in the most expensive housing market in the country, I'm sorry, folks, you're wrong. You need to move out into the suburbs if you want that single detached home, the same as every Canadian for the last 60 years has had to move somewhere else if they wanted a housing type that they could not afford where they're living. That is how we live in this country. That is how you work your way up the property ladder. You, if you're going to buy a condominium in Vancouver, thinking that you're going to work your way up the property ladder, you're wrong. You need to move, maybe you need to move out to Surrey. Maybe you need to move out to Burnaby. Maybe you need to move out to White Rock and move your way up the property ladder. That's the way that it happens. And the only re problem you have right now is governments are not allowing enough housing stock to be built. They believe it's more important that green, green living, uh, for worms, spiders, frogs, deer, birds, is important than people. We can have a sustainable housing stock that works uh, as an integral part of our greater natural environment with very little damage, if any, being done to our environment. It's time for our politicians to step up for the next generation of home buyers and allow that housing stock to be built. Without your vote, listeners, without your votes, that housing stock will not be built. They will force you to live in a concrete jungle. They will force your children to go up on playgrounds that are concrete. They're going to force your kids never to be able to live in some place where they can sleep outdoors in the backyard in their tent and watch the stars. If you want to let this conversation control your lives, that's your choice. Our role as home ownership consultants, our role in this marketplace is simply to relate the real facts of a housing market, how the housing stock needs to grow, how people need to own their home. We can't avoid the truth. We can't avoid reality. Your reality is dictated by who you vote for and what you demand of your politicians. If you want to let foreign buyers get a discount on their property taxes this year, while you, as a new first-time buyer of a condominium, watches your property taxes increase, that's your choice. Sorry to say, folks, it's time that we speak up. It's time that we start protecting Canadians. It's time that we, we take action. It's time that we get rid of foreign ownership of Canadian real estate in my humble opinion. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K. His website, thewealthyhomeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross or the show, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.